This is Dr. Leslie Allen in his teaching on the Book of Lamentations. This is session number 8, Lamentations chapter 3, verses 23 through 33. All that the mentor has been saying so far in chapter 3 and moving on further in chapter 3, it's all a prelude to a call to a prayer for repentance. And repentance is the key human factor that the mentor is going to stress as he moves on uh, further in chapter 3. And this, in fact, will be shown to be the way back to God's favor, to confess one's sins and to be able to start again with God and find a God of grace and a God of faithfulness and a God of compassion. In the scriptures, there are two ways of being accepted by God. And uh, one way is uh, pointed out in, uh, in Psalm 34. Uh, Psalm 34 and uh, verses 17 through 19. And notice what the uh, wording is. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Would you notice how it starts? The righteous, the righteous. And uh, there's this uh, call to, uh, to live good lives. And then you will have acceptance by God, and then you will find that God rescues you, you from any troubles that come your way. And we can call this the front door of acceptance by God. The front door is entered with good conduct when a believer has lived responsibly. But that doesn't always work. And uh, there is a back door. There is a back door. And the Old and New Testaments re refer to, uh, to, to this too. The back door is used by believers who are facing up to a bad, con to a bad conscience and are ready to confess their shortcomings. And in fact, Exodus 34, 6, if we think about it in terms of its context, is describing this, what we might call an emergency approach to God, when the front door is firmly shut and there's no, uh, there's no way of going through that front door of, of being in line with God and with God's blessings and God's... Uh, uh, salvation for, from crisis. And so believers who are praying prayers of repentance are using the back door. Uh, but over against that, th th this is only a, a second possibility. And mo the more ideal possibility is to, uh, is to go through the front door. And actually, the first letter of John speaks of both possibilities. It speaks of the back door in, in, uh, in, in chapter 1, uh, if we confess our sins, verse 9 of First John 1, if we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the backdoor approach. But then, in chapter 5, he speaks of the front door. The Apostle John speaks of the front door. The love of God is this, verse 3, that we obey his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. And he says, by this we know we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. And that's a front door approach. And God accepts us where, when we're in that situation. But believers, uh, we need not only chapter 5, but we also need chapter 1 the front door and the uh, open door uh, as, as well, the front door and the back door. But very much there's this coming in through the, through the back door. But fortunately, there is a back door approach. Fortunately, there, there is a way forward. And this is what Lamentations is talking about, in fact.
There's a, a chorus that I used to sing when I was at, at church in the young people's meeting uh, as a teenager. There's a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. There's a door that is open and you may go in. At Calvary's cross is where you begin uh, when you come as a sinner to Jesus. And that's the Christian version of the back door. And it not only applies to uh, becoming a Christian, but also when we are Christians, as, as one John one uh, points out. We, we saw that there was this uh, emphasis upon uh, survival, that um, uh, verse 39 is, is, is going to apply to the congregation. And all the way through, the mentor has the congregation in, in, in mind as he speaks of his, his, his own uh, situation. And he wants to say, like, like me, you have to accept you are being punished for your sins. And uh, why should any who draw breath, who are living, complain about the punishment of their sins? And I had to realize that my sins were being punished, and this was the, uh, this was the, the, the consequence. But let's mention now that pronoun switch in verse 23, great is your faithfulness. After these um, uh, third-person references to God, there, there's a sudden uh, emotional switch, and uh, the uh, mentor feels driven to turn directly to God himself. There's a parallel, uh, at least something similar, not the same, in, uh, in Psalm 23. Uh, and uh, here again, it, it, it's not often, uh, not often noticed. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd, he leads me in right paths, it goes on in third person. But then in verse 2, though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they, they comfort me, and it goes on in this you pattern. But there's this sudden switch at verse 4, and we wonder why that, that switch comes. And when I preach on some Psalm 23, I, I like to use the illustration of a, a little boy and uh, he's learned to walk and he can walk and he goes out with his mother and uh, needn't hold her hand now and, and he can walk forward and look back at his mother some way behind and he feels safe. But then suddenly he sees a big dog coming towards him. It's on a leash and uh, so it, perhaps it, it won't hurt him, but it might but he's scared by that big dog, and he goes back, he waits for his mother to catch up, and he puts his hand in his mother's hand. And there's, there's this turning, direct turning to his mother, that he needs that mother in that context of, of anxiety. So there's that switch there. Uh, but this, this switch uh, is rather different in motivation. Uh, in Lamentations 3.23, great is your faithfulness. It's grateful appreciation. It's turning to God and saying, thank you, God. Thank you, God. And, uh, but in both cases, there's a switch to a, a prayer uh, style. So now, let's move on to uh, verse 24. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I will hope in him. And this, this is something that, that, uh, that uh, appears in a, in, in a number of, of, uh, of places in, in the Old Testament. And we, we, we have to realize that, it's, uh, that basically it harks back to a verse in Numbers and a situation in, in the book of Numbers. Uh, Numbers chapter 18 and verse 20. And that situation... Uh, is talking about the, when the uh, Israelites come into the land. Uh, the uh, 11 tribes can be reassured they're going to have land to, to uh, um, use for, the, for, their, uh, for their crops, and so uh, food is, is going to be assured. But not for the tribe of Levi. Not for the tribe of Levi. They don't have any land assigned to them. They're not going to be farmers. All their time is going to be taken up in organizing the, uh, the, the sanctuary and being responsible there, a full-time job for them. And so this is where this statement comes to, from. Uh, the, the Lord says, 
to the tribe of uh, Levi, you shall have no allotment in their land, nor shall you have any share among them. I am your share and your possession among the Israelites. And what this means, of course, is that the uh, Israelites were responsible for bringing tithes and first offerings and gifts to God, and much of it would be in the form of fruit and vegetables, and they, they would bring it, they would bring it, and a portion of the animal offerings, they would bring it to the sanctuary as gifts to God, and God would pass it on to the tribe of Levi representatives who were on duty in the sanctuary at that time, and that would be, that would be their food. But it came from God. It came from God. True, it, it, it came through God, one might say, but it was because they were responsible for the worship that they were receiving. So no allotment in their land, and um, not having any share. But I am your share. I am your possession among the Israelites. Now, this, in fact, became uh, a... Uh, was given a spiritual meaning. And we, 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 we find in, in, in the Psalms that it gets picked up as an affirmation of faith. And ordinary believers would apply it spiritually to themselves and say, well, yes, I've got the land, I've got a job, I've got money coming in. But underneath it all depends on God. Uh, God is my support system. And fundamentally, it's all the gift of God. And so there's this dependence upon God that, that, that I have. And... Uh, I must take that seriously. And that can be a, a great comfort. And uh, for instance, we find in Psalm 142 and verse 5 in the course of a lament, I cry to you, O Lord, I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. I depend on you, Lord. I depend on, on you. And so I'm turning for you to you for help at this time. And so this is very much a, a spiritual uh, assurance. And that's what the uh, mentor claims here. The Lord is my portion. I depend on God. I depend on God's goodness. And so therefore I will hope in, in him. And he uses again this, this word hope. Verse 18, gone is all I'd hoped for from the Lord. Those old expectations had passed away. But verse 21, but this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. And he picks it up at the end of verse 24. Therefore I will hope in him. And that's not superfluous, that final reference in him. It's hope. My hope is God-based. And it, it's a theological hope. It's a spiritual hope. And uh, this, is, um, this is where I, I, uh, I, I stand. All right. <clears throat> and so we, we've come to a certain point in this, uh, in, in this. We've come to the end of this testimony, in fact. And in verses 25, uh, although the congregation don't get mentioned until verse 40, uh, it's very much speaking to them, and it, it takes the, the form of a, a, a sort of uh, sermon. But this testimony, which does really extend as far as verse 24, it's a lead-in to generalizing that personal testimony and applying it more directly to, to the congregation. Uh, it's not just true of me, it's true of any believer, the mentor wants to say, and it's true of you. And it's something you can apply to yourselves. And he was saying this implicitly uh, in his testimony, but now directly as he, he turns to it. And so the testimony is a means to an end. Uh, and uh, the congregation must have pricked up their ears. And it was safe in that testimony to listen to what the mentor was uh, saying. And they obviously identify with him as he talked about his suffering. And hopefully they would have listened too to that surprise ending uh, and accepted his sincerity in going on to speak in a positive way. Hopefully too, they would start to wonder if that could be true of them. And uh, after all, he's appealed to these elements of uh, standard Israelite theology and inciting Exodus 34 in verse 6, and it does make sense. 
And so that testimony is very much a means to an end. And uh, a generalization by itself would not have immediately attracted the attention of the congregation. They're prepared to hear him out in talking about his own experience. Oh, interesting. Uh, but that now this is a lead in to a sermon that, that he can present uh, from 25 uh, onwards. And so we're, we're moving now to the uh, uh, next part of the, uh, the uh, chapter. And uh, hopefully we'll get as far as, uh, as verse uh, 33. We'll move from 25 to 33. And here he's giving some, some general uh, theological teaching. And uh, he's uh, in integrating past uh, negative, bad experience with the possibility of a good expectation. And now, as I say, uh, the congregation are directly in view, even though he, he, he doesn't mention them. And he's encouraging them to uh, think beyond their present crisis of disaster and distress. And he uses a sort of a, a sermon style. And w when we were looking at the uh, antecedents of lamentations, the literary, lament literary antecedents, we, we mentioned uh, that there are in the Psalms wisdom Psalms that read very much like sermons. And uh, they're didactic Psalms. And they're obviously meant to, to, to teach, uh, teaching sermons. And uh, th this is the style that the uh, mentor adopts now. And there are a whole number of, of these wisdom psalms uh, which speak in this way. Psalm 34, which we've just quoted from, uh, and then Psalm 37, 49, 73 that we've quoted from, and then 92 and 112. And there's a loose link with wisdom literature proper, the books of uh, uh, Job, and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, they were written by professional wisdom teachers. And here, it's not wisdom teachers write, uh, uh, writing and talking, but it's, it's priests. Uh, priests had a double job. Uh, priests had to deal with the, the worship, all the details of worship and sacrificing, but also they had to deal with, uh, with teaching. They were the uh, teachers of uh, Israel. And uh, we had, uh, had, had mention uh, in, in the course of, of chapter 2 of the, the lack, of, lack of instruction. 2.9, guidance is no more. And I said this was instruction from the priests, that this was now, now lacking uh, after the fall of, of, of Jerusalem. And so this is priestly instruction which is being spoken of here, which leans on, picks up the style of professional wisdom teachers and uses it in a uh, wider way. In fact, the closest parallel to, uh, to, to our verses now uh, is in fact uh, Psalm 34, which we were just quoting from. Uh, Psalm 30, 34 and verses 11 to uh, uh, 22, they are, uh, in fact, uh, a, a wisdom-like psalm. And uh, it, it's rather interesting that verse 11 says, Come, O children, listen to me, for I will teach you the fear of the Lord. And it uses that word children, or, or sons, literally sons. And uh, that's the style that uh, Proverbs uses it. Uh, the, the students are addressed as sons. The, the wisdom teacher is the father figure uh, instructing them. And so the, uh, turning to a wisdom student, the wisdom student would be addressed as the son of the wisdom teacher. And this same style is followed in Psalm 34 in verse 11. Come on children, listen to me. And he's adopting this wisdom uh, style. Uh, a sort of sermon based on wisdom uh, thinking. Uh, but there's a basic difference. 
uh, because uh, Psalm 34, we were talking about the front door to acceptance by God and the back door. And Lamentations uh, has to adopt that back door, come in through the back door where the mentor and hopefully the congregation are concerned. But in Psalm 34, it's coming in through the front door, like 1 John chapter 5. And uh, we, we quoted uh, verse 37, when the righteous cry for help, but uh, the mentor had been guilty, and he was no longer righteous, and the congregation were no longer righteous, so they had to come in through the, through the back door. Uh, so there, there is that, that difference there, that uh, change in sort of uh, spiritual or theological principle there, where approaches to God are uh, con concerned. All this, of course, is going to uh, lead up to the uh, necessity for, for re re repentance. And uh, th this positive side is going to depend on confession of sin. And Lamentation 3 is eventually going to come to that point. But it's moving towards it, and it's creating promises and hope, which is the basis, and uh, uh, pointing forward uh, as, the, uh, as the way forward, uh, the way that is achieved via re re repentance. And it says in verse 25, The Lord is good to those who wait for him to the soul that seeks him. And then, verse 26, it is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Verse 27, it is good for one to bear the yoke in youth. And that word good, it's a very provocative word. My good. How, how can the congregation accept that? And how can the mentor say it? And it's the opposite of what he'd said just now. In verse 17, I've forgotten what good is, a good experience is. I've forgotten what happiness, prosperity, literally goodness. He sets the scene in verse 17 with that negative use of the word good. Outwardly, goodness was the thing of the past, but he, he wants to get beyond that and saying, even now, there is a way forward that involves goodness. And uh, he speaks theologically, first of all, and it describes the nature of good. And in some of those Psalms references, steadfast love, faithfulness, it was linked with God being good. And so here, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. To wait for is a synonym of hope. One needs to have this basic hope, this new expectation that there is a positive future beyond what we're going through now. And the Lord is good to those who wait for him. And so there's this blessing prospect. But one needs to, 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 to wait for God, to hope in, in God, to have this new positive expectation to share it. But it's amplified with to the soul that seeks him. And here you know, there's this first hint which is going to lead into the call for a prayer of repentance. That we have to do something and uh, we, we, we have to uh, uh, seek God. And in other words, we have to come in prayer to God. That's part of what seeking is. It's part of waiting, part of uh, uh, looking forward to that hope is relating to God once more. And uh, for the mentor, that's going to mean relating to God in prayer. So the assumption is that God has a positive purpose in, in, in view. Because he's good, there's a positive purpose beyond that um, deserved punishment. And uh, we can glance ahead to, um, to verse 38 which uh, sums up God's overall purposes. The mentor has been saying God has future good purposes, but he, he balances it, it out in verse uh, 28, verse 38. Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad come? The NRSV lets us down at this point, 
And uh, if we look to the new international version, then we find a better rendering in verse 38. Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both calamities and good things come? And literally, it's, uh, it is a contrast between bad things and good things. And there's a definite progression there. And there needs to be that, that progression, as in the, the NIV. That's the proper order. Uh, first the bad, and then the good. And that certainly corresponds to the situation of the mentor in his testimony, guilty, punished for sins, but looking ahead beyond even in his crisis. And it's true of the congregation as they were in this grim situation of crisis themselves, communal crisis, and they are urged to look beyond that, to look to a positive future. And so we need that order. So what went wrong with the... Uh, NRSV, is it not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad come? Well, the Hebrew says bad and good, but the translator uh, thought to himself or herself, that's not idiomatic in English. We don't say bad and good, we say good and bad. So let's make it stylistically nice. But it's ruined the meaning. It's ruined the meaning. And uh, nowhere is it good and bad. It's bad and good. And that's the order that it needs to be. And such the overall purpose. Beyond the bad, there is good. And this is what uh, verses 25 and 26 and 27 are saying by introducing this provocative word, good, as an expectation for the future, replacing all those sad expectations that had disappeared in their experience. And then, uh, and so there's this human side to that expectation. Uh, one needs to relate to God by praying to him, and that's the point uh, in the sermon that um, the, the mentor is going to arrive at at, at verses 40 following. But he pursues this idea of, of, of goodness, and, uh, and he speaks of, uh, of submission to God. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. He uses that blessed word salvation, which in the Old Testament is a very much an existential thing. It means deliverance from crisis, rescue from a bad, bad experience. And that so often is salvation in the, uh, in the Old Testament, and especially in, in the Psalms. And so he uses this uh, grace-laden word, a new grace-laden word, salvation, and connects it with God. And he picks up that psalm language now, salvation. But one needs to wait quietly and submit to God and accept what needs to be accepted, that punishment was necessary. And it's good because he realized that punishment was fair and just. And so one has to come to this point of view. And so be encouraged that if you do so, eventually you'll be rescued from the crisis with God's saving help. And verse 27, it is good for you, for one, to bear the yoke in youth. He'd spoken of that yoke. Uh, he'd uh, mentioned in uh, chapter 1 in verse... Uh, uh, 14. Well, it was, uh, it was Zion speaking, wasn't it? My transgressions were bound into a yoke by his hand. They were fastened together. They weigh on my neck, sapping my, my strength. And there, there's looking back to that experience and saying, that was your experience, congregation, wasn't it? That was your experience. And it was good for you to bear that, that, that yoke because it Again, it was fair and just that you should do so because you were being punished for your sins, in, in point of fact. Uh, and so it was, it was very necessary, and you, you deserved it. And the yoke, as in 114, is a metaphor for uh, being punished for, for sin, as, uh, uh, to be endured as a necessary burden. Uh, in youth, he, he adds that, uh, even in youth, uh, youths, young people, 
uh, are often not mature enough to accept what, what they deserve and, and they react against it. But it, it's still necessary, even for young people uh, in the congregation, to accept what's been happening and to interpret it aright. Now, 27 to 30, uh, if you read it through, it's all governed by that it is good. It's not just 27 that's good after verse 20, 26, but 28, 29, 30, syntactically all fits together. It's good for one to bear the yoke in youth, first, yes, and then 28, secondly, to sit alone in silence when the Lord has imposed it, yes. Thirdly, to put one's mouth to the dust, there may yet be hope. Uh, and then fourthly, to give one's cheek to the smiter and be filled with insults. And this is all talking about the grim experience that uh, the congregation had been experiencing. And, uh, and the, the thought very much is that, uh, yes, th this was necessary. This was necessary. And so one has to accept that this is so. And in, 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 verse, um, in, in, in verse 28, to accept the silence of grief, this is going to be opposed by verse 39. Why should any who draw breath complain about the punishment of their sins? You've got to accept it, yes, uh, in, in silence. And we shall be looking at verse 39 uh, to see exactly what, what it says. But we say at the moment it's the opposite is being contrasted in verse 39 to this sitting alone in silence. And then to, to put one's mouth to, to the uh, dust, to uh, accept a low quality of life, and uh, to give one's cheek to the smiter, be filled with insults, even to accept persecution and humiliation as part of God's will at this time, but implicitly not forever, not forever. Accept it, accept it, accept it. There's something we didn't read out. Uh, the second part of verse 29, there may yet be hope. It comes back to hope, but now it qualifies that hope. There may yet be hope. Oh, oh, there may yet be hope. And uh, that, that's rather a come down, we might think. Uh, the, the, there's contingency attached to this hope. Might not happen, might not happen, and we could be worried by, by that. So we need very carefully to think about this, there may yet be hope. More literally, perhaps there will be hope. Perhaps there will be hope. And one thing we have to realize is that in, in the Bible, when repentance is talked about, it's often linked to this divine contingency and linked with perhaps, it may be, or who knows. And let me read out these texts. Amos uh, 5.15, hate evil and look and love good. It may be that the Lord will be gracious. So there's a change necessary and it's really a call to repentance here. It may be the Lord will be gracious. Joel chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Return to the Lord. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent? Who knows? Jonah chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. All shall turn from their wicked ways, was the command of the king of Nineveh to his subjects. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. That's the Old Testament. Listen to the New Testament. Peter talking to the magician Simon. Repent of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. Very much in line with the perhaps and who knows in those Old Testament texts. And then 2 Timothy 2.25, the need for Timothy to correct opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant that they will repent and come to know the truth. I've never used a pre heard a preacher using that 
word perhaps in the context of the need for repentance. But it's there in the scriptures, old and new. So what are we to make of it? Well, there, there are three, uh, three aspects uh, that we need to, to, to bear in mind here. First of all, bear in mind God's sovereignty. It's up to the sovereign God when or whether a positive reversal in your circumstances occurs. That's what the mentor wants to say. We cannot claim it as a right. Uh, there's a providential factor beyond our control. We can't demand it. God is not a slot machine. We put the right coins in. Hey presto, the bar of chocolate comes out. We know that's going to happen. It must happen. If it doesn't happen, we complain to the management. No, it's not like that. There's divine sovereignty. In the end, it's up to God. And chapter 5 is going to come back to this point. Uh, something to bear in mind. This theological caveat of divine sovereignty. So that's one thing to bear in mind. The second thing is something we've already seen. Uh, what, what we call form critical associations, that there, there's a type of speaking. When you talk about repentance, you often link it with this qualification. Perhaps, it may be, who knows? And we went through all those texts in Old and New Testaments. And uh, it's true that, that it's not in this particular context, there may yet be hope, it's not immediately talking about repentance, but it's heading up to the need for repentance. And verse 40, let us return to the Lord. This is where the text is going. And so you need that, perhaps. It, 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 it may be, there may be, uh, may yet be uh, hope. And so it's a preparation for repentance. And so it fits in very well with those other texts. But then, too, it has a rhetorical uh, force. Uh, and it's used partly as a persuasive device. So there's a chance that's worth taking. Can't guarantee it. There's a chance that's worth taking. It's the only one you've got. And I should take it, if, if, if I were you, and see if it works for you. And so there we are. Dare to take this gamble, if, 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 if you like and see where it leads you. And uh, hopefully, uh, it, it will lead you in a wonderful direction. And so there's this challenge here. There may yet be hope, and we need to take that uh, uh, seriously. We come to uh, verses 31 to 33, that begins with the word for, and uh, it really it's explaining the good of verses 25 through uh, 27, we might say 25 through 30. What, 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 what is this goodness? What, what's it based on? How, how can you say uh, these good things are going to happen, and how can you say the Lord is, is good? What, what do you mean by that? And so, why is it good to react in these certain human ways? And how is it that God is, is good, as verse 25 said? And the first thing we, we've got to notice is that you, you get a, a lot of uh, negative words that get reversed here in uh, 31 through 33. The Lord will not reject forever. Although he causes grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love, for he does not willingly afflict or grieve anyone. And so there's positivity uh, coming on the scene over against uh, that negativity, that string of, of negativity. And th that, that word forever in verse 31, he will not reject forever, it's uh, saying present circumstances are temporary temporary or present punishment from God, accepted as such, but it's, it's a temporary uh, situation. And that, that, that idea of God rejecting, uh, we, we, we've had it before in chapter 3, and we're going to have it again 
in terms of unanswered prayer. In verse 8, though I call and cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. And I feel rejected by God. And then uh, in, in chapter uh, um, uh, 40, in verse 44 of chapter 3, you've wrapped yourself with a cloud so that no prayer can pass through. And this is mention of a lack of, of forgiveness uh, on God's part. But this rejection, it's not going to last forever. It's temporary in, in, in point of fact. And that delay in answering prayer was part of, of the punishment. That not answering prayer, it was part of the punishment. You have to accept as such. But this is not a mark of God's future dealings with you. And then he uses this word to cause grief and grieving. And this is a word that he picks up from uh, earlier in the, uh, in the liturgy. In verse uh, 5, the Lord has made us suffer. It's the same Hebrew word. The Lord has made us suffer for the trans multitude of her transgressions. And then uh, Zion picked it up in 112. Uh, the sorrow which the Lord inflicted on the day of his fierce anger. It's that same uh, Hebrew word that we get uh, twice here, uh, rendered uh, to uh, cause grief and to, and, and, and to uh, uh, grieve. And so it's picking up uh, a verb that's been associated with, the, uh, with this whole catastrophe culminating in 586. And so over against that, you have compassion. Uh, and over against that, you have the uh, abundance of God's steadfast love. Compassion, Exodus 34, verse 6 again. And Exodus 34, verse 6, something we didn't quite have stated before. The abundance of his steadfast love. The abundance. And uh, back, in, uh, back in verse... Uh, Verse 22 and 23, uh, where so much of Exodus 34 and verse 6 was, was, was quoted, in fact, uh, you didn't have that word abundance. But what does 34, 6 of Exodus say? The Lord is abounding in steadfast love. Abounding in steadfast love. And so there's this coming back to this theological foundation uh, laid for um, a repentant Israel. Uh, to, to start again with God. And then verse, uh, verse 33, uh, he does not willingly afflict or grieve anyone. That's an interesting expression, willingly. It's a good translation, but not a literal one. But literally, from his heart. God not, does not from his heart afflict or grieve in anyone. And uh, it's saying it's not a natural thing for God to, to, to do. And this reminds us of when we were talking about the wrath of God, that, that that's uh, something that, that, that comes in as a necessary phenomenon, but it, it's not a natural attribute of, of, of God. And so, so punishment, all this talk of punishing, sometimes God has to do it, but it's compassion and steadfast love. They're the regular attributes of God and we can look forward to a return to experience those. So God doesn't afflict because he wants to but because he has to for the sake of justice and fairness. But his heart is elsewhere. It's not what he would like to do. His natural instinct is to show compassion and uh, steadfast love. Uh, but uh, for now he hasn't been able to do it. But that's not the sort of person he is in himself. That's not Yahweh's nature, though it's necessary at times. But instead think in terms of compassion and steadfast love. That's where your future lies. And so here again, this is part of this new set of expectations, theological expectations, and what better could... Uh, a nation in, in covenant uh, fellowship with God uh, expect or take seriously. And of course it's all paving the way, the human um, stage of acceptance and that human stage of uh, repenting in fact and, 
uh, sharing God's views about one's own sin. And then, then there could be a, a launching and an unleashing of this compassion and this steadfast love. Next time, we will be looking at um, verses 34 through 51. <laughs> This is Dr. Leslie Allen in his teaching on the Book of Lamentations. This is session number 8, Lamentations chapter 3, verses 23 through 33.